missing session of the week. The final one? I can hardly bear it. Thousands of years ago, the islands of southeast Alaska were covered in a vast sheet of ice and snow. Above the snow fields, only the very tops of the mountains as we know them today were visible. These peaks are called nunataks. They represent the very earliest uncovering of the land. As the climate became warmer, the ice slowly retreated. The great glaciers, moving rivers of ice, sculpted the mountains and valleys in their passing. Gradually, a new landscape was unfolded. The land that emerged was softer and more gentle. Forests grew on the lower slopes of the mountains, and new animal species colonized the more favorable environment. But one animal was already living here while much of the land was still covered in ice. The brown bear is among the most ancient of all land mammals. It's also one of the most powerful. A brown bear fears nothing and has no enemies except man. Though the landscape has changed around them and today they're faced with many threats, the great bears still reign supreme in the forested islands of southeast Alaska. The Alaskan brown bear is the largest living carnivorous land mammal. When standing upright, an adult male may tower over nine feet high. It can weigh over a thousand pounds. Brown bears are really omnivorous, feeding on meat, fish, and a variety of plant foods, depending on the season. Brown bears are noted for their thick, heavy coats. The color may vary considerably. Even in one population, bears of many different shades of brown are sometimes found. Some are almost black. This leads to confusion with the American black bear, a different species. But the large size, massive head and shoulder hump are characteristic of all brown bears, whatever color. In Alaska, the bears that live in the interior are called grizzlies. They're smaller than the bears of the coastal regions. That's because richer feeding and a more favorable environment allow coastal bears to grow larger and heavier. Today, one of the largest populations of coastal brown bears occurs on three large islands in southeast Alaska. Together, they comprise an area of over 5,000 square miles. Here, the great bears are still found in good numbers in the mountains and forests. In early spring, the land slowly unlocks itself from the fastness of winter. As the temperatures slowly rise, a thaw sets in, causing snow slides. In the rivers and streams, new life is already beginning. Salmon eggs laid the previous year have hatched. The tiny fry provide rich feeding for birds like the golden-eyed duck. For the animals which live here, the coming of spring marks the end of several months of hardship. Canada geese return to the river valleys. For most of them, this is a stopping off point on their journey northwards. Others will stay to nest here. Black-tailed deer live in the river valleys too. In a hard winter, many will have perished and only the fittest survive into spring. Though winter has released its grip on the valleys, it'll be some weeks yet before the mountains are freed too. This is where most of the bears have been living since late the previous autumn. They've spent the harshest months of the year in hibernation, after digging themselves lairs in sheltered spots high up on the slopes above the tree line. With the approach of spring, the bears start to emerge from hibernation. A bear has already left this den. Its tracks lead uphill to the nearest ridge, which provides the bear with an easy route into the valleys below. A newly emerged bear takes time to become fully active. It may return to its den several times before it leaves for good. 
A bear needs time to readjust to life outside the den. Some bears are very lethargic. Gradually, the bears move down from the mountains into the river valleys. Now they are fully active again and begin to feed seriously. Wasted after its long winter fast, a bear needs to take in a lot of food as soon as possible. The first flush of sedge grasses on the tidal flats of the rivers coincides with the arrival of the bears. This provides them with their first real meal in over four months. Females with young cubs emerge from hibernation later than other bears. They begin to appear in the river valleys in May. The cubs were born in late December or January while the female was denned up for the winter. At birth, they were blind and helpless and no bigger than squirrels. But by the time they're three months old, they're well developed. Brown bears normally produce two or three cubs, though sometimes there are four in a litter. A female bear only breeds every third or fourth year. The cubs stay with their mother for about two years. Usually they've left her by their third summer. While they're still small, the cubs are entirely dependent on their mother. She's very protective towards them. A female with young cubs is very nervous of other bears, with good reason. Adult male bears sometimes kill young cubs, so the mother quickly takes her family away from the possible danger. Brown bears are solitary animals. The only time two adults associate on friendly terms is when a female is in season. Courtship takes place in May or June and lasts for several days. A good deal of close contact is probably necessary for these normally antisocial creatures to become fully compatible. After the mating period, the bears will resume their solitary ways. Delayed implantation means the embryos won't start developing in the female until later in the year. Her cubs will be born next winter. As spring turns to summer, the river valleys take on a new lushness. For the black-tailed deer, a short season of plenty lies ahead. A great blue heron comes to fish. The bear's home is shared by the bald eagle. The islands of southeast Alaska provide ideal and relatively unspoilt habitat for these majestic birds. Elsewhere in North America, bald eagles are rare, but they're still common here. There are more bald eagles in coastal Alaska than in all the other states combined. The rich waters along the coast provide them with excellent fishing grounds. In early summer, nesting pairs of eagles are found all along the shores of the coastal forests. By July, the short Alaskan summer is at its peak. The snow has disappeared even from the tops of the mountains, while in the valleys, the rivers begin to take on a new significance. Each year, in late July, millions of chum and pink salmon return from the sea in order to spawn. The salmon have a special importance for the bears. They have been feeding chiefly on plant foods. Now they begin moving toward the rivers in readiness for the biggest feast of their whole year.
It's July in southeast Alaska. In the rivers, the annual salmon run is underway, and the bears have come to fish. Bears begin to move into the fishing areas in early July. The exact time when the salmon begin their run varies from river to river and with the different species. But the bears seem to know when it's worth starting to fish. The bear uses a lot of energy fishing, but a protein-rich salmon is well worth the effort. Standing on its hind legs gives the bear a better vantage point from which to select its quarry. This technique is particularly helpful when a bear fishes in deeper water. Most brown bears are skillful fishermen, but trying to catch a second fish before eating the first simply won't work. It's often thought a bear sweeps the salmon out of the water with its paw. But what really happens is this. The bear actually caught the fish with its jaws. During the course of a fishing session, a big bear can eat over a dozen large salmon, though it may take several hours to catch them. Despite the attraction of the salmon, fishing bears maintain a respectful distance from each other. Prime fishing spots are first taken by the most dominant animals. Others must wait their turn. Most bears have already established a rank order based largely on size and weight. But new conflicts sometimes arise. The bear on the right is eating a fish it's already caught. By movements of its head and body, the bigger bear shows who's boss. In this way, the bears avoid harmful conflict. Where the smaller bear loses its fish, there's no fighting or bloodshed. Females with cubs also come to the rivers to fish for salmon. They tend to keep away from the more popular fishing spots when other bears are using them. Though the cubs watch their mother with interest, they're too young to fish themselves. mother decides to try a fresh spot, and the cubs follow her. Still no success, and the cubs have lost interest. Finally, their mother moves off. The cubs have to catch up as best they can. The female is still watching for an opportunity to catch a fish. Like all fishermen, bears have good and bad days. But this bear doesn't give up that easily.
finally her luck changes. Although the cubs played no part in the catch, they're eager for a meal. But their mother makes no special effort to share the fish with them. They have to grab what they can. Single cubs are often larger than twins of the same age, possibly because one cub has no competition for its mother's milk. And when it comes to scrounging leftovers of fish, a single cub can get a bigger share. While its mother is fishing, the cub finds other things to do. It's extremely curious, and the crows and ravens which come to scavenge the remains of fish offer an outlet for its exuberance. But danger is never far away for females with young cubs. Another bear, this one with an older cub, arrives to fish. The female with twins decides there are too many other bears close by. There's a certain amount of tension. Though cubs from different litters sometimes associate together, their mothers, like all adult bears, prefer to avoid any close contact with each other. The cubs are led away from a possible confrontation. Bears fish for salmon at any time of the day. The cool of the evening is a favourite time, despite the emerging hordes of insects. The middle of the day is a time when fishing activity is often reduced. On a hot August day, the lure of a deep, cool pool sometimes overrides the desire to catch the fish swimming in it. Adult bears rarely play together unless they're grown-up cubs of the same litter. But already their relationship is becoming strained. In the coming months, they'll drift apart as each takes up a solitary existence. By late August, the salmon run is almost over. Some bears, sated by a rich diet of salmon, have already left the rivers. But many continue fishing for several weeks to come. Now the feeding behaviour seems to change too. Often, only the choicest parts of the fish are eaten. The rest is cleared up by the scavengers. Now that their eggs have been laid and fertilised, the adult salmon have fulfilled their task. All of them die after spawning. Bonaparte's gulls die for the newly laid eggs along the gravel bottom of the river. The banks and shallows are littered with the remains of the bear's feasting. By the time autumn arrives, most of the bears have left the valleys and moved back up the mountainsides. In a few weeks, they'll be seeking out places in which to dig their dens. In the meantime, they're feeding on roots and berries. After several weeks spent eating fish, 
the return to plant foods is probably a welcome change in their diet. But more importantly, it's the bear's last chance to lay on fat to last them during the coming winter. The last fine days of autumn provide the well-fed bears with a brief interlude before they dig their winter dens. A patch of last year's snow attracts a mother and her cub. By late October, the first storms of winter arrive. Gradually, the snows return to the mountainsides. Soon, the bears will be denned up for the winter. The coming months hold few hardships for them. After digging its den, a bear settles into a period of dormancy. Already, the bears have stopped feeding. The layers of fat they accumulated during the summer will tide them over the months ahead. By November, the bear's season of activity is over. Usually, they stay in their winter dens until early next spring. Then they'll emerge to renew the cycle over again. The great bears of Alaska have always followed this seasonal pattern of behavior, which is dictated by the harsh elements. But now, they're having to cope with more than just the forces of nature. Already, brown bears have been eliminated almost everywhere in the rest of the United States. In Alaska, they still exist in good numbers. But surprisingly little is known about these impressive creatures and their habitat needs. There's no doubt that bears require vast areas of unspoiled country in which to live successfully. In coastal Alaska, timber cutting, together with the expansion of human settlement, has already altered the landscape dramatically. Large-scale removal of timber has also damaged many salmon rivers with the accumulation of debris and silt and changes to the water temperature. This reduces the number of salmon and the bears may be denied a vital food source. If continued in the future, this damage to the salmon rivers could affect the bears adversely. Another threat to the bears lies in overhunting them. Bears have always been highly prized as trophies but the increasingly rapid alterations to their habitat, together with the bear's slow reproductive rate, means they may not be able to withstand the present level of hunting. More research into this problem is necessary. Today, Alaska's coastal brown bears face an uncertain future. Though they've lived here for thousands of years, their home is now threatened. Is it too much to hope that they'll be able to live on in the years to come? No treasure islands on Monday, but on Tuesday, Lundy's Golden Mile with seals, starfish and puffins.